Okay, before we get to atavistic structures, I would be amiss if I didn't show you one last example of vestigial structures that are so cool, near and dear to my heart, because I have lived in places near the ocean where I got to go and see sea lions and seals all the time. So uh, seals, everybody knows what a seal is, everybody knows what a sea lion is probably, this little guy right here. You may or may not know about manatees. Uh, manatees live in the Florida Everglades. They're highly endangered and they're constantly getting injured by boats, for example. Um, they actually have a cousin species that was alive in the early 1900s and humans hunted it to extinction. Uh, but it's a very close cousin that lived um, in uh, like the Strait of Gibraltar, or those areas. So what is so cool, and I've gotten to experience this out in nature, um, if you look at the flippers and the tails of seals, sea lions, and manatees, in addition to their behaviors and, you know, their ears, those that have them, I mean, you can see similarities and you can actually see similarities of these guys with their um, land mammal ancestors, which were things like wolves, um, not wolves, but things like wolves. Um, but check out these flippers. Just like at the flippers, we see vestigial structures. Here's the northern elephant seal. And you can see his flipper has claws, just like a dog's paw, right? So you see the claws here. Um, harbor seal, also you can see the claws. So these guys obviously are different species of seals. They're highly um, related to each other. But if you look at a sea lion, they actually don't have claws in their flippers. So this little chart here gives you, um, here's a, a northern fur seal. Um, here's a harbor seal, a northern elephant seal, and a, a California sea lion. So the sea lion, this guy down here, has lost his claws altogether. He just has more of a typical flipper like you'd find on a, on a whale, for example. Um, same thing with the northern uh, fur seal. But the harbor seal, this guy, and the northern elephant seal, this guy, still have retained their claws. So perhaps they're a more recent addition to the water than, than their cousins over here. And if you look at the tails, it kind of mimics this idea that they might be more recent additions because if you look at the California sea lion and the northern fur seal, their, um, their tails are just kind of one structure here. Um, these are fused legs from their land mammals, um, their land mammal ancestors, whereas the northern elephant seal and even the harbor seal, um, you can kind of see where these legs had been you know, once separated and now they're joined together. And if you watch the behavior of these guys, like a harbor seal will actually scratch themselves with their tails, just like a dog would with their hind legs. It's pretty funny to watch. Um, and uh, if you look at the manatee, the manatee has a flipper that still has nails in it. And if you watch these guys, for example, at SeaWorld at the bottom of their tank, they'll actually walk with their flippers. How crazy is that? Um, if you were to take x-rays of the inside of the flippers of all of these guys, you will find hand bones just like we have. So uh, the skeleton of a sea cow, you can actually see one, two, three, four, five fingers just like us, all that had been inside a flipper, and that's true of all these guys. So if they were specially created, why do you need all these different finger bones in a flipper? doesn't do you any good, but if they shared a common ancestor with other vertebrates like we did, it would make sense that they still have leftover vestigial bones that no longer serve the same purpose. All right, so that's vestigial structures, things that, structures that the organism has that has a lost, reduced, or modified function from the ancestors. But let's go on and take a look at an atavistic structure. So an atavistic structure or an atavism is different from a vestigial structure. Vestigial structure, everybody has a structure in that species, but it's a different function or lost function for what it was in the ancestor. Um, I'm going to move my head up here so you can see some of these cool pictures we're going to be talking about. Now, an atavism or an atavistic structure is where most of the individuals in the species do not have that trait, but once in a while and, um, a mutation happens and that a certain individual is born with a structure that would have been present in all the members of an ancestral species, but has been lost over evolutionary time and suddenly makes a reappearance. And some of these are crazy. And you see these in even humans with uh, people with certain genetic 
um, abnormalities that have crazy things happen. We'll go over a couple of those. So um, again, presence, presence in the adult organism, it's the reappearance of a trait that was lo lost to a different ancestor. And so it's appearing in a particular adult but was missing from their parents or their recent ancestors. So common example, the dewclaw of dogs and cats. Not all of them have it, but basically it's a remnant of the thumb, which has been lost in most of the individuals. Horses. Once in a while, you'll get a horse born with an extra toe. Because remember, the hooves of horses and other hooved animals are actually the third finger of what would be our hand. Um, they have had a loss of the other fingers. I'm not going to show you this on the camera, but you get the idea. The first and second and fourth and fifth fingers have been lost over evolutionary time for these hooved animals, and they've had an emphasis on the growth of the third finger to become the leg bone and the hoof. But once in a while, a mutation happens where during embryonic development, enzymes are not released where there should be, the enzymes would normally degrade those other fingers, and instead, um, something doesn't get degraded and it grows, and thus you get the finger growing. Um, and so if you look back at some uh, fossil evidence from species that were like horses that we believe gave rise to horses, um, and so you found all these fossil bones that have been um, discovered, and if we go back here uh, 55 million years ago, you can see this particular species had four toes. Um, later on, 35 million years ago, um, this particular one had three. Um, another three, but you can see how those two that flank the third one are becoming reduced. And by the time you're in recent evolution, as in just a few million years, you now have just that third toe that's been developed. But if you look at this modern horse here, that toe that suddenly appeared as an atavism is the same toe that was present in all the individuals of its ancestor species. How cool is that? And get this, okay, um, brace yourself because what you see here are bones that are leg bones. We have the femur, that's your thigh bone, and uh, this would be a tibia bone that's in your, um, in your shin. These leg bones were found on a whale, specifically on a humpback whale. Fishermen were out there, they caught a whale, and it had legs. And they're, just imagine their surprise, you catch a whale with legs. In fact, once in a while, and this has happened in several species of whales, baleen whales, humpback whales, you name it, they have caught whales that had parts of legs, or even in some cases, full legs with toes. How crazy is that? Those are atavistic structures. We know that whales, we know this through DNA evidence as well as fossil evidence, we know that whales are mammals that live in the water, but are descended from mammals that lived on the land, things that looked kind of like a, a wolf. And so obviously their wolf ancestors or wolf-like ancestors had legs. Those were lost over millions of years, over evolutionary time as those animals took to the water. And by the time you have modern whales, most of them have lost those legs completely. Instead, you know, they put their ATP to structures that help them swim in the water. Well, once in a while, the genes that turn off the expression um, of legs don't, you know, they get mutated and those genes get expressed and thus legs grow, legs get expressed. How crazy is that? But more evidence of macroevolution. The idea that they still have the genes for making legs, all whales do, but those genes are get, getting shut off during embryonic development. But when something goes wrong, ta-da, they get expressed and you get a whale with legs. And that's not all. Um, so it's rare. These atavisms are rare, but they do occur. Um, so if you look at the fossil evidence for um, the evolution leading to modern whales, so here's a, a phylogenetic tree, an evolutionary tree, which we'll be having another tutorial on those. You can take um, fossils of an ancestral land mammal that we believe gave rise to the lineage of whales. And you can kind of trace it down and see what's happened to the legs over time. If you look at the skeletons, I will move my head back down here so you can see these guys. Um, here's one of the earliest ancestral species that lived in the water. And you can see this guy, all of them had long legs with toes, but they were also good swimmers. Um, and if you look 
later on in evolutionary history, you can see where the pelvis is being modified and the legs have become reduced. And by the time you get to an even more modern ancestor like Duradon, they actually have lost their legs completely, although they still have a fragment of a pelvis. And we know this from fossils that we found. And of course, most modern whales have lost all that altogether, except in the rare cases where their genes get expressed for legs and then they have legs. Crazy, huh? Um, what about humans? Well, how many of you knew that there are humans who are born with tails? Yes, sorry, Bob. There are humans born with tails. And so these would be examples of atavisms. Most of us don't have tails, although all of us have tails at a, up to a certain stage in embryonic development, but we have genes that cause enzymes to be secreted that eat away our tails. Because that doesn't really serve us very well. Tails, why do we need tails when we're bipedal? So our primate, other primate ancestors had tails, but we don't have tails. Although once in a while, somebody is born with a tail. So for example, here is an x-ray from, I believe about a five or six year old girl, I think she was five, and she's actually born with extra vertebrae. So instead of just a Cossacks, she actually will have these extra vertebrae and she actually has a tail. Here's a six month old baby that was documented. This is not what you think, this is a tail. Interesting, huh? Kind of looks like a pigtail, but it's a tail. And so for some of these guys, um, they don't actually have vertebrae in them. They're just kind of um, floppy tissue. But others actually have true tails where they actually have vertebrae and nerves and skin and fat and muscle, and they can actually wag their tails. Like there'll be newborn babies with these tails that wag in response to, you know, emotion, like when they see their, their parents. How crazy is that? So, um, you know, they've, these can get to be up to five inches long, but yeah, in some cases they can actually wag their tails. Humans. So in most cases, if they lived in an industrialized nation, you know, they would have surgery to have these things removed, but there are still adults with tails walking around with tails, but that's an atavistic structure because most of us in this species don't have them, but once in a while something changes in the DNA uh, the enzymes don't get expressed, and thus the gene for tails gets expressed. Okay, we have talked about comparative morphology and atavistic and vestigial structures. We're now going to look at pieces of evidence for macroevolution from embryology, and so that is the topic of the next segment.